For part three of today's virtual lecture, we are going to talk about section 6.2, the pigeonhole principle. Recall the image I left you with last time of five pigeons in being distributed amongst four pigeonholes. No matter how those pigeons choose to select where to, to land, at least two of them have to end up in the same pigeonhole. That is the essence of the pigeonhole principle. And yes, it seems like common sense, and I hope you will be delightfully surprised at how sophisticated the arguments we can make are with this one observation. Let's start by stating the simple form of the pigeonhole principle. If n plus 1 objects, uh, those are going to be our pigeons, are placed into n boxes, the conclusion is that at least one box contains two or more objects. It's possible all of the pigeons flew into the same box. So imagine all five pigeons being up here. Well, that box still contains two pigeons, and the statement is still correct. So that's sort of the simplest form. We can kick it up a notch by talking the generalized form of the pigeonhole principle. In this case, we're going to have n objects, our pigeons, are being placed into k boxes, um, the, re the conclusion then is going to be that some box contains at least the ceiling of n divided by k objects. So here we're rounding up using the ceiling function. And then finally there's the strong form of the pigeonhole principle, which looks a little bit more complicated. In this case we're going to specify n integers one for each box. It's sort of the filling factor for each box. Q1, Q2, Qn. They're all positive integers. In this case, we're going to have the sum of Q1 through Qn minus the number of boxes n plus one objects, pigeons. So this represents the number of pigeons we have. And they're being placed into n boxes. When this happens, the result is that either the first box contains Q1 objects, or the second box contains Q2 objects, or the third box contains Q3 objects, all the way down to or the nth box contains Qn objects. So the generalized form sort of has us filling the boxes equally. The strong form allows us to choose how our boxes are forced to be filled. It's choosing what pattern we're looking for. Let's examine the strong form of the pigeonhole principle uh, a little bit more closely. And, and in fact, what happens if we set the filling factor to 2 for every single box that we're considering. Well, the number of objects then that are being distributed is, uh, so Q1, Q2, Qn, those are all 2. So that would give me 2 times n. The number of boxes is n, so I subtract n plus 1, and I end up with 2n minus n plus 1, that simplifies to n plus 1 objects being distributed to n boxes. So when our filling factor is always 2, we're in the situation where we have the hypothesis of the original simplified form of the pigeonhole principle. The conclusion becomes the first box contains two objects, or the second box contains two objects, or the third box contains two objects, or the nth box contains two objects. That's the conclusion of the simple form of the pigeonhole principle. The best way to understand the pigeonhole principle is to use the pigeonhole principle. So let's go through 
five different pigeonhole principle problems. Problem one, there are a 805 lockers in the athletic facility and 4,026 students who need lockers. Some locker sharing is going to have to occur. What's the smallest number of students that must share a locker? Number two, given any 101 integers between 1 and 200, show that there exists a pair of integers, no matter how you selected them, where the smaller number of the pair evenly divides the larger. This ends up being a specialization of example 11 in the book, and I just want you to see it in a concrete context rather than a generalized context so you can get a better feel for it. A classic theorem of Erdos and Zekeresh uh, from 1935 says that if you have a sequence of n squared plus 1 distinct real numbers, that sequence is going to contain a subsequence of length n, ooh, that's gonna, it needs to be n plus 1 numbers that is either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Number four, uh, this is an example that's the beginning of Ramsey theory. It's the classic party problem. Given six arbitrary students, show that there are either three mutual friends or three mutual acquaintances. And taking that again, kicking it up a notch, given ten arbitrary students, show that there are either three mutual friends or four mutual acquaintances. You might want to take a few minutes, uh, think about these problems, see if you can make any headway on your own, and when you're ready to come back, start part four.